Bible, page 544, and it is Psalms 23, verses 2 and the beginning of 3. Page 544 in the Bible, Psalm 23, 2 and part of 3. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Okay, I'm going to say a word, and I want you to just respond. Is this a good word or a bad word? Okay? Workaholic. Did anybody say good? Not one? Oh, okay, got one in the back, say good. Okay. I didn't understand the word. Workaholic. Good or bad word? Now, it was interesting. In my early service this morning at 9 o'clock, uh, nearly every person who said bad was female. And that's a bad word. The men were split about 50-50. Half of them thinking it's good to be a workaholic, and half of them thinking it's not. Uh, you know, we find fault with lazy people, right? Nobody wants to be called lazy. We don't like to work with lazy people. We want people to pull their own weight. And we reward workers. You know, somebody puts in extra time, they get rewarded for it. Um, if you have a job where you punch a clock, you get rewarded with overtime pay if you work more. Um, now, in the spirit of uh, Jeff Foxworthy's, uh, you might be a redneck if, I'd like to, uh, to help you identify whether or not you might be a workaholic. Uh, this is my list I have of you might be a workaholic if. If it frustrates you that they don't allow you to take your laptop on the Ferris wheel, you might be a workaholic. If you're looking forward to Christmas this year because you might decide to take the afternoon off, you might be a workaholic. If the only time you've had off in the past three years is to attend your favorite uncle's funeral, you might be a workaholic. If you use your cell phone in the shower to return business calls in the morning before you go to work, you might be a workaholic. If you don't have a tan by July 15th, you might be a workaholic. If you set your alarm for 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. so you can check your voicemail, you might be a workaholic. If you carry family pictures in your wallet just so you can remember what the children look like, you might be a workaholic. And my wife asked me to add this one. If you take a week of vacation and still go to the office at least three of those days, you might be a workaholic. Uh, I think I told you last week that uh, this is going to be kind of an ouchy sermon for me. Uh, I got under conviction doing it uh, and preaching it. Um, and so I just want to be up front with you and tell you, while I believe everything I'm going to say today is 100% true, uh, I have not yet mastered doing all the things I'm going to tell you are supposed to be done. Okay? If you want to try and follow along and, and make sense of what I'm talking about, again, we have the insert there. Maybe help you remember later. Uh, from the 23rd Psalm, we have two images. Of one of rest and one of refreshment. It makes me to lie down in green pastures. It leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Psalm 127 verse 2 says this, It's senseless for you to work so hard from early morning to late at night. God wants his loved ones to get proper rest. In other words, the Don Moore paraphrase version is, It's dumb to burn the candle at both ends. God says, live a balanced life. There's time for work, there's time for rest, there's time for play. A CNN poll, 59% of Americans would like to slow down. <coughs> A Harris poll showed that uh, compared to 10 years ago, the average person has eight and a half hours less of leisure time per week. 
So what's the prescription for the workaholic? What's the prescription for busyness? We've got an acronym spelling out the word relax. Realize my worth, enjoy what I already have, limit my labor, adjust my values, and exchange my pressure for God's peace. And if you're trying to keep up, I will repeat those. I'll get back to those. Realize my worth. You know, a lot of people confuse work with worth. If we work much, we achieve much, so we're worth much. When you meet someone, how's the introductory process usually go? Hi, my name is Don. My name is Fred. What do you do? Right? We frame what we know about people, what we think about people, what we think about, our, about ourselves, oftentimes in relation to what we do for a living. John's one, John, James 1.18, God decided to give us life through the word of truth so we might be the kind of first truths, in other words, the most important of all he created. God wants us to know that out of all his creation, we matter the most to him. Matthew 6, your heavenly Father feeds the sparrows and you're far more valuable to him than they are. If God notices when a bird falls, and he does notice when a bird falls, certainly he notices and cares for us. I don't know if it's possible while we're on this earth to ever fully understand how much God loves us. You know, we say things like, God can't love you any more than he already does. We say things like, God, you can't make God love you less because his love for you is not based on performance. But I don't know if we fully grasp what that means. I thought it might be good today to actually give you an object lesson to show you how much God loves you by the very fact that he is love. That his love for you is based on who he is not who you are or what you do. And so we're going to pause right now and we're going to share communion together. Marvin's going to come and assist me.